You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 11, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, pollen and spore identification. Our presenter is Dr. Charles Barnes. He's an emeritus professor in the Division of Allergy Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay, thank you. We'll uh, go ahead and get started then. Uh, This is uh, pollen spore identification. The last time I talked to you guys was on uh, aerobiology and collecting things out of the air. And so this is how to basically identify the things that, uh, that you've collected. So uh, some of the things we're going to try to accomplish are we're going to see if we can learn the characteristics of pollen grains and fungal spores. And these characteristics, of course, enable their identification. We're going to become familiar with the general morphological characteristics of pollen grains and fungal spores. And a lot of times on your um, fellowship exam, you will get descriptions of pollens or spores that contain some of the words we're going to go over. And so just just the being able to recognize that these are words for the shape of things uh, will might help you out a little bit. Uh, if they really treat you nice, so they show you a picture. <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk about the most common pollen and spore types in Kansas City, and Kansas City has just about everything that you find in the whole United States, a few exceptions. Um, and then we, if we get to it, we'll talk about the value of pollen counts and and their value uh, to you in the clinical setting. Uh, if you want to learn more about this topic, uh, there's lots of training available. Uh, the Quad AI, I think, still runs aerobiology courses. Uh, they run both basic and advanced courses. A lot of times, uh, one year there'll be a basic course, and the next year there'll be an advanced course, and then the next year there'll be a basic course again. Uh, and they support the National Allergy Bureau, which is a network of pollen and spore uh, counting stations that uh, publish data and put data on the Quad AI website or the National Allergy Bureau website. The Pan American Aerobiology Association uh, is still active every now and then, not as active as it used to be, and they'll uh, on occasion run a spore camp, and they'll generally advertise uh, either through the Quad AI or or through uh, uh, colleges and universities about when they're running a spore camp to teach pollen and spore identification. Uh, They also have a certification bureau to certify uh, people who provide estimates of airborne pollen and spores, mostly spores, and this is mostly for for the uh, indoor home inspection industry. Uh, Ashna Clinic, generally about every other year, runs an aerobiology course, and you get to go down and spend a week in New Orleans and uh, go out to Oshner and collect and identify spores and pollen. And the International Aerobiology Association, uh, about every couple of years, provides a basic course where you get to, if you want to take that, you get to fly out to some beautiful place, a lot of times in the Alps or uh, uh, some gorgeous uh, setting in Europe, and spend a week there going over pollen and spore identification. And then the National Allergy Bureau is the main uh, allergy-associated pollen and spore place. They certify counters, and they also collect and disseminate information. Uh, Some of the things that you'll need to know if you want to identify pollen and spores uh, is, number one, what time of year is it? if it's in the dead of winter in Kansas City and the snow's been falling, you're not going to have a lot of pollen in the air and you're not going to have a lot of spores in the air. Although I have collected 
I collected air in Kansas City on some of the coldest days, and every now and then you'll find a spore. So, you know, they're not completely absent, but the concentrations are very low. Uh, you, know, you need to have an idea of what the dominant regional species are, and, and uh, you can tell this by just looking around you and s to see what's flowering. Now, unfortunately, the, 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 uh, the plants, the flowering plants that we are dealing with don't have a very bright, bright uh, flower, so you have, to, you have to have an idea of what the flowers look like and what you're looking for. But uh, you, need, you, need, you need to know what's producing pollen in any particular time. And once you know those things, then you can start dealing with the pollen size and shape, the features on the surface, like whether they have apertures, pores, slits, or both, uh, other surface characteristics, whether they're rough or smooth. And when you look at these things under the microscope, you also need to understand the reaction to whatever you're staining them with. Uh, when they are flying through the air, pollen, not spores, spores look pretty much the same. They have a really hard outer shell and they look pretty much the same. But pollen are dehydrated and shrunken. And so they don't look anything like you expect them to look. Uh, once you collect them, you put a stain on them and the stain uh, has a, a dye in there to uh, delineate certain areas of the pollen, but it also has a relatively high concentration of um, glycerol or some other, um, or gelatin or something like that, something that's going to push water into this spore, and, I mean, sorry, into this pollen and make it swell up. And that swollen picture is the picture that you'll always see in slides and things like that. And that's one reason why the... Um, the automatic device that, that uh, you're using to collect and identify pollen now uh, has such a hard time is because it's having to use artificial learning to identify what these shrunken pollen pieces are. Um, and frankly, that's something a human really can't do. So if you look at time of year or season, uh, lots of allergy practices around the country draw maps like this uh, and several of the, uh, the extract companies provide maps like this for different parts of the country. This is one uh, for the asthma practice in, in the middle of Texas and they have a really good selection of things but you'll see that they, they're presenting the concentration on the top here of grasses and uh, you'll notice their grass season starts pretty early around the 1st of March, peaks in June, and then occurs again in September, October. And that's pretty close to the grass season in Kansas City. Uh, if we have a really cold winter, it won't start until later March. Uh, if we have a warm winter, it might start at the end of February. Uh, but generally it peaks around June, and we also have a second season uh, in September, October, we have a, a fall pollinating grass known as red top. And so you can see grass pollen uh, really most, uh, most months of the year in Kansas City. But only high concentrations in May and June and July. Uh, but something like spores, mold spores here in the brown, uh, you can see they kind of go up and down. And you can almost always, in Texas, this is, uh, Central Texas, so they're a little warmer than, you, than we are, but uh, you can see the concentrations go up and down and actually tend to fall during the hottest parts of the summer and go up during the wettest parts of the year, which in Texas, of course, will be in the spring and then uh, sometimes starting in the fall, they start to get moisture. And then they get trees like ash and sycamore and mulberry and willow. They have relatively short seasons. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of oaks, so oak season can be a little longer. And then in the fall, they tend to get ragweed. And ragweed, of course, um, is, is found just about throughout the United States except for the West Coast. But 
we in the middle of the country tend to get more ragweed and higher concentrations, and especially in Kansas City and Tulsa, Oklahoma, we tend to get very high concentrations of ragweed. And something like mountain cedar, which is almost the same as juniper, um, tends to pollinate in the winter time. And we also tend to pollinate, get mountain cedar pollen in the winter time. And a lot of times we get mountain cedar pollen that comes all the way up from Texas. If the uh, upper air wind currents are, are right, uh, this pollen will start in northern Texas, southern Oklahoma, and blow all the way up to London, Ontario, Canada. And the uh, that's been confirmed by DNA analysis. So, you know, we can have different pollens in the air just about any time of the year around Kansas City. And um, either it comes in by long distance transport or we produce it right there. Uh, now, there are some regional characteristics. And this is uh, from Hollister with the northeastern pattern on the left and the southwestern pattern on the right. And you'll, you'll notice that the northeast has alder, whereas the uh, southwest has acacia. They both have ash and birch. Uh, the southwest gets a bottle brush, which is uh, actually kind of akin to, to ragweed a little bit. Uh, then they both get cedar juniper and cottonwood. Uh, things like maple and oak are the same, but the southwest will get mesquite where the northeast does not get mesquite. And, and so you see some local differences, but you see some uh, a lot of similarities. Um, and also for, for weeds. Uh, you know, you pigweed, these are part of the kenopod kino, amaranth group we'll talk about later. Um, lamb's quarters, plantain, uh, nettles, thistle, and sage, things like that. You see in most areas of the country here. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about the regional species that we find in Kansas City and that you find throughout most of the United States. Up here in Alaska, even though they have a lot of, uh, a lot of pine trees, the pine pollen or a lot of spruce trees, actually, the spruce pollen is actually pretty heavy and, um, and doesn't cause them a lot of problem. Their main allergen is birch because they also have a lot of birch pollen. So uh, for trees, uh, Tree season can start as early as January and actually can be in a little in uh, December if you, if you think about it. And this is the typically a juniper. And juniper is, is in the same family as cedar. They're cupriaceae. Um, often they're only in the spring in our area, sometimes uh, they'll be as early as January, February. Sometimes they'll be February and March. They love to pollinate when it's wet and cool, but not freezing outside. Um, elm trees, we have a lot of elm trees in our area. They're generally a little later than the juniper, but they can be as early as February and generally are done by March. And elm has a very characteristic pollen. Uh, maple. We have a lot of maple trees in our area, uh, all over the United States from, and into Canada. And oak trees, we have about 50-something different varieties of oak trees in our area. Now, grasses, the main thing to remember about grasses is they all look the same. So this is a, a grass pollen down in the uh, bottom of the there we go this is the grass pollen down in the bottom of the picture and you'll notice that grass pollens have one hole in them and so they are monoporate and other than that they really don't have a whole lot of characteristic features if you can look closely in here you can see some starch granules 
uh, depending upon the, the particular kind of grass. But all grasses, everything from the northern pasture grasses, which are the grasses that you mostly know the names of, things like timothy and ryegrass and uh, fescue and brome grass, uh, they're all in the same group, whereas the Johnson grass that was brought in here for cattle food, but actually turns out to be lousy cattle food, uh, is in a different group and pollinates later in the year. And then the Bermuda grass, which uh, was brought in here from the islands, and the Bahia grass, which has a characteristic Y shape on the uh, pollen producing portion, all came from the southeastern United States and the islands. But the, all of these grasses have a pollen that looks the same. And you really can't tell uh, through the microscope if it's different or not. Okay, and then weeds. We have quite a few weeds in Kansas City, and one of our main weeds is ragweed. Okay, so I should check it this time to make sure you guys are still there. Is everybody still there? We're here. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is a this is the flowering head of a giant ragweed plant. Generally, these things are are uh, five, six feet in the air, but this one just happened to grow in the fence and got stunted. And all of all along this little uh, yellow flowering head here are tiny little flowers that are bright yellow. And each one of those little flowers spews out thousands of pollens. And so they just fill the air full of ragweed pollen. And we have just gone through ragweed season and you guys have probably seen quite a few patients that are ragweed sensitive. And this is an, another picture of giant ragweed showing you the leaf. And you'll, if you look around, you'll see these all by the side of the road. They're generally five or six feet tall. And they have this characteristic three-lobed leaf that kind of falls over like a rag. And that, I suppose that's where it gets its name of, of ragweed. But uh, they have a very characteristic pollen. We'll see a picture of it later. The other group, and this is in the, uh, ragweed is all in the sunflower family. Uh, you can tell it by the beautiful bright yellow blooms they have, even though they're very small blooms. But we also have a lot of amaranths, uh, which are pretty much in your vernacular known as kenopods, and that's how they, you'll find them in the uh, skin test tray. They'll be in there as, as uh, a kenopod or kenopodium. The nomenclature people have been fighting about this for a while, and it, and the latest I know is they've grouped all the kenopods in the amaranth family. But anyway, they have a very unique pollen. It looks kind of like a a soccer ball with lots of little holes in it, or maybe a golf ball. And things that are things that generally end up uh, being called some sort of weed, like pigweed or ironweed or goosefoot, things like that, generally all fall into the kenopod group, uh, along with, a, a, uh, and, and in this family are, are also lots of um, grain products that the Native Americans consumed for many years, and it has come back into the diet in recent years, and it's known as kiwa. And so it comes from the, the name kenopod, and generally it's an ironweed type that uh, produces a big, uh, a big uh, grain, and you tear the husk off of that grain, and it produces kiwa that uh, you can find in the grocery store these days. As far as I know, it hasn't really caused a problem uh, between the kenopod pollen that we're exposed to and eating kiwa. So I haven't known anybody who's come in uh, talking about having a patient with kiwa allergy yet. Okay, now the, the one thing that you need to remember about uh, pollinating f plants is that if you're, a, if you're a plant and you produce a really pretty flower so you can attract bees or you produce a really pretty smell 
so you can attract flies or, or other insects, so you produce really horrible smells so you can attract flies. Um, you're going to be, you know, you are adapted to pollinate through insects. If you produce a tiny little flower that really is very difficult to see and uh, it doesn't have any particular smell to it and it's really not set up in any way to attract insects, it is wind pollinated. And the wind pollinated term that you'll hear is anemophilous, like an anemometer for wind. And the flowering plants that are insect pollinated are entomophilous. And so from entomology, of course. And so that's a, a general rule of thumb that you can pretty much uh, follow. Uh, you won't see a whole lot of people coming in and saying they're allergic to roses. Uh, and, you, won't, you know, that's why you don't find rose in your, in your skin test tray. But you find a lot of people come in uh, who are allergic to ragweed, and that's why you do find ragweed in your skin test tray. Ragweed, of course, is an anemophilous plant. It just throws its pollen out into the air. And wherever it lands, you know, it just makes millions of pollen, throws them all out in the air um, to go wherever they want. Whereas an entomophilous plant uh, depend, is, makes a heavy pollen. It would, if it got into the air, it would fall to the ground. So they depend on bees and flies to carry them from flower to flower. Now, there are some examples uh, that... that kind of do both. Every now and then you can see a red clover uh, pollen in the air, but mostly bees carry it around. And the same for Queen Anne's lace. Every now and then you can see a Queen Anne's lace pollen in the air, but we generally don't see enough so that I, I, I haven't heard of a case of allergy to Queen Anne's lace, but you every now and then can find one in the air. Uh, the other really interesting example we always talk about is goldenrod and goldenrod is out this time of year uh, beautiful flowering plant you can use it in in uh, in displays of flowers and things like that it occurs the same time as ragweed does and so somebody is sneezing a lot and ragweeds out there pollinating but they see the goldenrod and they'll come in and they'll say i'm allergic to goldenrod well generally they are not allergic to goldenrod. They're allergic to ragweed at the same time. And in so many instances when the even the drug companies that, that uh, advertise allergy medicines will come on and say it's, time, it's allergy time and they'll show a picture of goldenrod. Well, goldenrod most likely is not the problem. The problem is something that's pollinated at the same time as goldenrod, which is ragweed. Okay, so let's look at the anatomy of a pollen grain for just a minute. Uh, there's an exterior, known as an exine. There's an interior, known as an entine. The interior has got lots of things in there you can't see, protoplast, messenger RNA, enzymes from metabolism. But it does have some sometimes some big starch granules that are stored up to provide energy. And sometimes you can see these starch granules on the inside. And the outer part of the uh, exine is known as the ect exine. And the very far outer part that you will actually stain is known as the tecum. And the inside of the enzyme, entine is known as the plasma lemma. And these are just some, some words that you'll hear bandied around whenever they're talking about pollen and spores. Uh, maybe... You see them on an examination or something like that. Um, generally, the tectum is the outer layer. Uh, pollens that don't have an outer layer like that, that, something that doesn't stain like that, is a tectate. Uh, with a continuous outer layer, it's known as eutectate. And if it's a broken outer layer, it's known as semi-tectate. You know? And so uh, if somebody, to, to make the question a little harder, you can start using terms like this, just, just realize, uh, think about the word and you'll figure it out. Pollen shapes. There, there are lots of different pollen shapes. They can be circular, triangular, oblate, which is long and flat, uh, spheroid, which is completely round, or 
prolate, which is uh, round and and uh, and extended up and down. So pollen, of course, is three dimensional, and you have to think about the three dimensions when you look at it. So if you look at the at the pine pollen here, and and pine is such a heavy pollen that it has to attach two big air bladders to the pine pollen so it can actually fly through the air and get from tree to tree. Uh, so if you look at it from one direction, it kind of looks like this. If you look at it another direction, it looks like a Mickey Mouse. And if you look at it from the side, <coughs> it gives a completely different look. But pine pollen is one of those that is typically recognized from the shape. And normally when they show you a picture of it, they'll show you the Mickey Mouse view of it. Uh, pollen can be oval, and this is a Queen Anne's lace pollen, just because it's a good example of an oval pollen. But you see every now and then, and there's a pore in the middle here. There are actually two pores. There's one on this side, and there's one on the other side. So when you're thinking about pollen pores, you have to realize that, that they can be arranged all around the pollen. Uh, this is a round grass pollen here that's monoporite, and grasses are one of the pollens that tend to be pretty much exactly round, whereas something that's triangular, uh, this is a maple pollen right here, it's triangular, and it's got three slits in it that actually is a thinner area in the pollen that extends like a slit around the pollen. So you can think about the shape, the apertures or the holes in the pollen, uh, they can be inaccurate. No, no aperture present. Uh, they can have a colpus, which is an elongated aperture that's often pointed in the center or a slit, look like that uh, maple pollen had. They can be colporate, which means they have both a slit and a pore in the middle of it. Uh, they can be porate, monoporate, like the grass slide grass and we saw, or they can have a sulcus, which is kind of like a colpus, except it's narrower and more elongated, and a lot of times just around the latitudinal areas. Um, characteristics, uh, these, are, uh, these are words that, again, you might run, in, run into. They can be clavate or club shape, echinate, remember echidnas, uh, what was the uh, Sonic the Hedgehog and, the, and his friend the echidna? Uh, which is pollen with spikes or spike elements. Uh, ragweed is actually sub-echinate, which is they have little spikes, but they're short little spikes. They can be granulate or perforate, which means they can have elements on the, in, on the interior that look like small holes. They can be lofate. They have an outer X sign that creates a pattern of ridges. They can be silate, smooth, reticulate with a network pattern across the outer surface, or they can be striate with parallel elements running across the outer surface. Uh, of course, you know, we could, we could spend basically forever on these characteristics, but we'll just cover some of the main ones. And these are the pores. So in after it is no pores. Monoporate is one pore. Diporate. Is two pores. Uh, mulberry is very much like this, and typically the pores would be located actually almost opposite one another so that you really wouldn't be able to see them head on like this. Uh, triporate, three pores, and of course, you know, if you've got two located out here, they're actually going to spread themselves pretty evenly around the, the pollen grain, so this third pore would actually be back behind into the uh, pollen grain. So you have to think about these things in three dimensions. Uh, stephanoporate, a uh, uh, good example of this is uh, oak or something like that. Uh, stephanoporate is multiple pores, six or more, but they're, or five or more, but they're scattered around the equator. And they're not, they don't stray into the top or the bottom of the pollen. They're all around the outside. And so that's stephanoporate. And elm is the example of that that we see in our area all the time. And then periporate, six or more pores spread equally 
quickly so you, you can see a bunch of pores here and a bunch of pores behind. Uh, uh, plantain is the real example of that that we see in our area, but also that uh, amaranth pollen that we saw earlier would be periporate, has lots and lots of pores on it. Uh, apertures are slits, so this would be inaccurate, a monoculpate type thing. A triculpate would have three slits, so you'd have one on the side here, one on the side here, and one in the back that you can't see. And triculporate would have three slits, and each slit would actually have a pore in the middle of it. So that would be tricolporate, and some oaks are tricolporate. Um, and then reactions to stain. Uh, this is a juniper pollen. You've put, we put the stain on this, and the stain has a high glycerol content, and so it, uh, it has a high ionic strength. And so it pushes water into the juniper pollen here until the exxon, which is the blue area here, actually breaks open, and the entine and the interior portion of the pollen grain pops out. And these, of course, when they break open, can have that characteristic Pac-Man shape to it. And so juniper pollen is the one that has the Pac-Man shape to it. Uh, now we've already looked at the pine pollen, but you can see the pine pollen here has picked up some purple stain, except in the air bladders where they actually are, they stain so much they stain dark and almost look black. Uh, this is a sorrel pollen, and there are three small slits in it along the outside, but it's picked up the stain very strongly, even so you can see some interior <coughs> features that are not all the same, so you really can't trust what you see on the inside. And then this is an oak pollen, one that really hasn't picked up the stain much at all, but it's come out in this staining to be kind of golden looking. So you're really looking for how it looks when it swells and what the shape is. The color can be a little deceptive sometimes. So or, uh, color really doesn't tell you much as far as pollen goes. You're really looking for the color to allow you to delineate the shapes. So in the spring, we get trees. And this is a good example of juniper here of a Pac-Man. Uh, juniper pollen with the middle of the pollen popped out, and this is the exine that's broken open and leaves that characteristic Pac-Man shape. Uh, this is a cottonwood that really doesn't have pores on it at all, uh, but it has very thick outer surface and a nice uh, uh, granulate interior entine here. Uh, this is the maple uh, that we've seen before with three pores in it. This is an elm. It's stephanoporate. There are five pores, and they're all arranged around the outside in this, uh, in this view. Um, there's an ash. Ash has slits in it, and it actually has four. So there's one here, one here, one over here, and one in the back. And ash is the thing that is the one that's kind of looks square and has four pollen in it appears about the same time as oak, which has three slits in it, often with a pore in the same time. But a lot of times what you see is just this triangular shape here and uh, not, uh, you know, a little hard to tell. So, you know, it, it takes some experience and some looking at these to, before you get all the characteristics. Uh, mulberry is diporate, one on each end here. And they're small, and they don't generally don't stain very darkly. And then birch has very characteristic pores on there, very strong pore with a, a nice uh, stained raised area around it. So you can see you can use the pores and the and the slits to sort of identify or start to identify these, these things. <laughs> the grasses. Uh, Things like ryegrass, rye, Kentucky bluegrass, June grass, orchard grass, fescue, timothy, brome. Those are all northern pasture grasses. 
Johnson and Bermuda grass um, are generally later in the year and, and generally are put in a different allergen category. Bahia grass is in there too. And then red top, of course, that can be a, a fall grass. But the other grass that we don't think about is corn. And corn is actually a grass, and so it produces a pollen that looks like this, except it's really big. And, and it's really unusual to see corn pollen in the collection, but I have a few times. Uh, now, weeds, uh, this is a sorrel with the just barely noticeable slits in there. This is a plantain. It's periporate. You can see one, two, three, four right here, and there are probably another four on the back, so six or so. Uh, this is an amaranth kenopod. Uh, generally, 10 is about the cutoff. If you see fewer than 10 pores, it's generally a plantain. If you see more, it's generally an amaranth kenopod. And you, of course, can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You see about 10 or 12 here. Uh, Cocklebur. Is really it really doesn't have a noticeable pore, but has a very characteristic exine. Uh, xanthium, I mean, sorry, mugwort. Uh, Cockleburr is xanthium. Mugwort uh, has a very characteristic shape here, kind of three-lobed. And marsh elder has a very characteristic exine. Again, it's just kind of fuzzy looking. So, uh, and then this is ragweed ambrosia down at the bottom. And ragweed, of course, is uh, echinate or semi-echinate, sub-echinate. So you can see the little short spikes up here. Many other members of the sunflower family, uh, if you see the pollen collected, they will have actually much longer spikes on it. But ragweed has lots of spikes, and they're just kind of short. So that uh, finishes us uh, spores. Is everybody still with us here? We're all still yeah. here. Okay, great. All right. So the next thing we're gonna kind of look at is fungi or fungal spores, and and fungi is actually the name of the kingdom. Mold is a lay term, but people tend to use it interchangeably and you'll come have people come in and say they're allergic to mold and uh, what they mean is they're allergic to fungi and so you know if in the in the phylogenetic tree you have prokaryotes and eukaryotes uh, fungi are eukaryotes and then you have kingdoms and as these kingdoms started to get identified there are now seven of them but when fungi were given their own kingdom it was the fifth kingdom identified, and so you'll, there's a book out there called The Fifth Kingdom Fungi. Um, but fungi are identified mostly by their unique metabolic pathways, and they have a unique lysine synthesis pathway that's characteristic of fungi. Uh, most fungi are saprophytes. That means they live by digesting or decaying wood and other vegetation. And so you'll see, you know, a rotted tree. You'll see lots of different fungi on it. You'll see uh, mushrooms growing out from the roots. You'll see bracket fungi uh, forming kind of a shelf on the side of the, uh, of the de decaying and dying tree. And so mostly uh, fungi develop, uh, I mean, mostly fungi excrete enzymes. The enzymes they excrete digest things around them like wood, and then they reabsorb the nutrients that are digested from the material around them. Okay, so they're eukaryotic organisms. They're known as yeasts and molds and mushrooms and bracket fungi and plant rusts and smuts, which are plant pathogens, and puffballs, and they go by lots and lots of different names. But you, everybody can recognize a mushroom when they see it. Uh, and this is a corn uh, smut, which is a parasite on the corn plant. And this is a puffball, 
on the, at the top here, and you can actually see like a raindrop has hit the puff ball, and it is puffed out a little cloud of spores at the top. Uh, they can be, they all have a similar metabolism. They secrete enzymes into their surroundings and absorb the breakdown products of the actions of those enzymes. And some of the enzymes they excrete are well-known allergens. Uh, there's several fungi that excrete a lysozyme that's a recognized allergen and several more. Uh, this is the most up-to-date uh, phylogenetic tree for fungi that I know of. Uh, Jay and I were fortunate enough to work with Estelle Leviton down in, at the University of Tulsa, and we published a series of articles, and this is one of the articles that was in there. And so basically, for phyla in fungi, you have the zygomycota, the ascomycota, and the basidiomycota. Basidiomycota are, are uh, mushrooms. The zygomycota are, are um, fungi that grow on, a lot of times, on bread, but also on horse and cow manure and things like that. And you see it uh, out in the field a lot, but this doesn't get airborne a whole lot. Uh, however, you will recognize the name mucor because uh, mucor infections have been really bad uh, in people who have gotten COVID. And um, several, you know, several people, or probably more than that, numerous people have gotten a mucor infection and died of it uh, during the time when they had COVID. But almost all of the uh, spores that we would really deal with by name are in the ascomycetes, uh, things like uh, yeast, candida yeast, saccharomyces, uh, cladosporum, alternaria, curvularia, dreschleria, bipolaris, helminthosporum, stemphilium, uh, epicoccum, aureobacidium, aspergillus and penicillium, trichophyton, uh, fusarium, all of well, these are names that you of uh, spores that can be identified out of the air. Now, one of the problems is that these things were all identified before they were organized into the phylogenetic tree, and so uh, and and the thing that complicates the matter is that ascomycetes can be produced by sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction. When they're produced by asexual reproduction, they look like the one that was produced right before them. But when they're produced by sexual reproduction, the spores look different and really can't be identified and so are called undifferentiated ascospores. So these two, these, all of these things have kind of a separate life form in the asexual and sexual reproduction era. Um, the other thing that you have to run into uh, is because of regulatory constraints, in other words, the regulatory people don't like to change things, and once they get approved, the drug companies don't like to change things, um, many fungal allergen extracts retain names that are really obsolete. And so if you go looking for them in the fungal literature, a lot of times you won't find the name. Uh, however, when the reorganized taxonomy uh, was looked at, we started to notice that IgE, that the person who makes IgE to one type of fungus will make IgE to another type of fungus that's closely related in the phylogenetic tree. So it You'll also, you, I'm sure you've noticed by now that a person who's allergic to one fungus is generally allergic to several, and those several are generally pretty close to each other in the phylogenetic relationship. So, you know, people have examined systematic cross-reactivity quite a bit. Also, fungi contain cell walls that are very similar to each other, and they contain chitin and beta-glucan and whereas plant cell walls contain uh, one-four beta-glucan, fung fungi contain one-six beta-glucan. 
these elements of the fungal cell wall interact very strongly with elements of the innate immune system. Um, so fungal surfaces have important targets for recognition by the innate immune system. Uh, so the beta-glucans, the chitin, which is uh, N-acetylglucosamine, poly-N-acetylglucosamine, the mannins or polymanos, the mannoproteins, and the galactomannins. And all of these things are recognized by the innate immune system. Uh, in addition, fungi uh, can be unicellular or they can have thread-like bodies composed of hyphae. And a single thread is known as a hyphae. And a hyphae can be uh, maybe one to two millimeters in diameter, but long. And hyphae grow at their tips and frequently branch. Uh, producing an interconnected network of hyphae. And so a network of hyphae is called a mycelium. And this is true for the ascomycetes, but it's also true for the basidiomycetes. If you look at a mushroom closely, you'll, look, you'll see a mushroom is composed of stringy material, and that is the hyphae. And when all that stringy material gets compressed together and grows together, you actually get the body of the mushroom, which is the mycelium. Okay, and we already talked a little about fungal reproduction, but um, these spores are adapted for airborne dispersal. They are produced by meiosis or mitosis. Um, they have structures that are, that are difficult to identify whether they're in the sexual reproduction stage. Uh, but in the asexual reproduction stage, the differentiated uh, spores and the hyphae actually have a characteristic look, and so those can be identified. Um, so early on, the identifiable spores were lumped together and called deuteromycetes. Well, that term doesn't work, doesn't work anymore because they're all also ascomycetes. Uh, so deuteromycetes is an old term that really doesn't have a whole lot of meaning, but you may see it bandied around, especially in the older literature. Uh, there have been some name changes uh, that you have to deal with in the clinic. For instance, your clinic, Penicillin Notatum, is now known as two different species, uh, Penicillium chrysogenum and Penicillium rubens. Uh, the extract companies are pretty good about giving you all of the names and letting you know when there's say when there's a name change and when uh, when they actually produce something and call it Penicillium notatum, but it's actually Penicillium chrysogenum. Uh, but these things are still around. I think Jay wrote an article a few years ago saying that we need to, we need to eliminate and improve the, uh, the uh, fungal uh, nomenclature and the extracts, and I don't know if anything's happened about that since. But anyway, spores have characteristics just like pollen does. Uh, they have anatomy, taxonomy, pores, septations, aerodynamics, and surface characteristics. Uh, so these are some shapes. Uh, you get things, you know, globose, ovate, fusiform is something you see, these long skinny spores. They have all the uh, uh, sexually reproduced spores have an attachment site on them, a place where this spore was attached to the last spore from which it came. Uh, whereas ascospores or sexually produced spores are produced eight at a time in a bag or a sack, ascus is actually the Roman word for sack, and they do not have an attachment site on them. But you get lots of shapes, lots of different shapes, uh, lots of different surface characteristics, smooth, granular, even some strange cup-looking uh, characteristics on the surface, warty things, reticulate patterns, all kinds of things are possible on the surface of a spore. 
uh, spores also can be uh, divided. They can be non-septate. They can have transverse septations. They can have both transverse and longitudinal septations. Alternaria is known for this. Or they can have random septations, uh, like an epicoccum. Uh, they can have a pore plus the attachment site where they were attached to where, wherever they grew. Uh, they can have an attachment peg. They can have an attachment scar. And this is a characteristic of Cladosporum, uh, whereas it, it, where it grows as the mycelia branch, and then it, you know, the mycelia becomes a mycelium, and then the mycelium differentiates into the spores. And so characteristic for Cladosporum, you can have three or more attachment sites per per uh, spore here. Uh, there can be internal architecture. There can be even appendages on spores, although we don't see many of these uh, in the air around Kansas City. So these are some of the examples. Uh, alternaria is club-shaped or clavate. Uh, you need, you have both longitudinal and transverse septations in it. Uh, this club shape gives it a particular aerodynamic character, which many people will speculate allows it to get deep into the lungs. Uh, high, high alternaria spore concentrations have been associated with asthma attacks and a couple of major publications that are a little bit older now, but uh, uh, seem to be really associated with uh, the ability to cause asthma and even deaths from asthma. Uh, epicoccum, uh, just general septations. It looks kind of like a soccer ball here. Pithomyces, a uh, lot, lot looks a lot like alternary, except there's no tail or beak on it. Uh, both longitudinal and transverse septations, kind of a barrel shape. Here's Cladosporum with uh, this one, I think, having three different attachment sites where this line of spores fell off of it and where another line of spores fell off of it. You can see here two together. This one grew, was attached to this one, which is probably attached to the one next to it. So that's very characteristic for Cladosporum. Aspergillus, uh, you can only tell them Aspergillus and Penicillium apart if you see them growing on a surface or a, or a, a auger plate. The Penicillium has finger-like or paintbrush-like structures, and penicillus is the old Latin name for paintbrush, whereas aspergillus has a little ball or um, club-like structure where the spores originate. What you see in the air is the spore. And so all you see in your microscope in a typical air collection is just a bunch of these little spores. And you don't know if they're aspergillus or penicillium. But the aspergillus here, uh, the name comes from the aspergillum. And if you remember when they invest the pope, the guy comes down the, the aisle dipping a, a stick-looking thing in holy water and sprinkling it on either side. And that stick is about the shape, same shape here as the aspergillus. And the stick was probably named before the aspergillus uh, shape was. And then you have a whole bunch of small spores that are not necessarily characteristic in shape. Uh, sometimes they'll have septa, sometimes not. And these are undifferentiated ascospores. They're a result of sexual reproduction in all of these things and a bunch more. And so we're just called undifferentiated ascospores. And we do the same thing for basidia spores. We just see basidia spores. It's a large group, but we say it's basidia spores, and we'll call it undifferentiated basidia spores. Okay, so these, these pollen counts have public relations value. Um, you can find in almost every major city somebody is publishing a pollen count. Uh, Children's Mercy for many years has published a pollen count, and we still publish a pollen count. Uh, just sometimes the machine works better than other times. 
Um, but I noticed that uh, I still get a pollen count from Jay, um, even though we don't do it by visual means anymore. We do it through a, by a machine. And uh, we, for many years, reported to the National Allergy Bureau, which keeps up with the pollen, has a large database of the pollen in each of these, uh, over 80, and I think it's getting near 100 now, different sites throughout the United States. And you'll notice the number of sites tend to follow population and not geography. So in some places where the population is pretty low, like western Kansas, uh, there are not a lot of pollen and spore counters. But it's generally counted, uh, put out there in a form where the public can identify with it, like uh, high, low, medium, or green, red, and you know, green, yellow, and red. And there is a commercial company that produces pollen estimates. Uh, and this is from historic data. And they will give you an estimate for just about any city that you want to ask for an estimate from, for. Uh, sometimes their estimates are good. I mean, if you're in the middle of, of I mean, sorry, if you're at the beginning of September in Kansas City, you can make a pretty good estimate that there's going to be a lot of ragweed in the air. But sometimes they're not so good because uh, in Kansas City also, if we get a heavy rain about this time of year, the ragweed concentration drops to zero. Or if we get an early frost, the ragweed concentration can drop to zero. And yet, in some years, it hasn't dropped to zero, and so their estimate will say there might still be ragweed in there when there's not. So uh, there is still commercial value. These guys sell a lot of, uh, a lot of commercial time to the... Uh, uh, Zyrtec people and the uh, Flonase people and things like that. So um, you'll notice that the, the Zyrtec people start to advertise just about when the pollen concentrations start to come up in an area. So there's a lot of commercial value to these, um, and they're available out there. And so that's about all I've got for today. Uh, any 